Wow, I'm excited for this. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, guys. You've got two of me in a row. Um, if I'm looking down at my phone more, um, I didn't write this schedule, but this is going to be a free-flowing one for sure. So, um, Rahul, let's start with some context, some intros. Rahul, the Superhuman, we all love it. But how did you come to found Superhuman? How did you come to change our lives with email? How did I come to found the product? Well, I previously also had an email company that some folks here may remember called Reportive. It was the first Gmail browser extension to scale to millions of users. On the right-hand side of Gmail, we showed you what people looked like, where they worked, their recent tweets, links to their social profiles, and this thing grew like crazy. In less than two years, I ended up selling it to LinkedIn, where I ran all of our email integrations. And during those four years, I became intimately familiar with how professionals do their email, and the TLDR is really badly. So we decided, let's build the fastest email experience in the world. It's blazingly fast, where search is instantaneous, where everything happens in 100 milliseconds or less. An email experience where you never actually have to touch the mouse, where you could do everything from your keyboard and fly through your inbox. An email experience that had the best Gmail plugin functionality, but built in natively, and one, of course, that just worked offline. And so with that vision, we built Superhuman. Now, I, the thing I loved about Superhuman was kind of the exclusivity that it had from very, very early days. It was obviously kind of invite only from what I remember, and it had this kind of aura around it. And you've been very surgical in terms of how you build buzz and hype to get early customer traction. Can you talk to me about how you thought about this and some kind of core takeaways for you? So we were really surgical about our positioning. And I think this is, I want to make this as actionable as possible. This is something every startup here can do, is get precise about your positioning. The best resource to start with is this article by Ariel Jackson. It's called Positioning Your Startup is Vital. Here's how to nail it. You can Google it right now. And in the article, she uses a fill-in-the-blanks approach. It goes something like, for your target customer who has a key need or opportunity, your product has a key benefit. Unlike competing alternatives, this is its key differentiation. That sounds very abstract. I'll give you an example. She uses one Harley Davidson. So, for macho wannabes who want to join a gang of cowboys <laughs> and who live in an era of decreasing freedom, Harley Davidson is the only motorcycle manufacturer in the world that makes big, loud motorcycles. And if you're familiar with the brand, you'll know that captures it in a nutshell. And I say this as someone with a Harley in my garage back home. So we thought about this for a while, and we started asking questions like, are we the Ford of email? No, not really. Are we the BMW or the Mercedes of email? No, still not quite. Are we the Tesla of email? Yes, now we're starting to get somewhere. We did a whole bunch more reading, and by the way, here's another book recommendation, Positioning the Battle for Your Mind, and we eventually came to the following positioning. For leaders and managers of high-technology, high-growth companies, Superhuman is the fastest email experience ever made, especially for those who feel like their work is mostly email. It's what Gmail could be if it were built today, not 15 years ago, and in Superhuman, everything is meticulously crafted, blazingly fast, and happens in 100 milliseconds or less. Now, you might think that is ludicrously niche. How many people in the world could possibly fit that? But to paraphrase Paul Buchheit, the creator of Gmail, it is far more effective to make a lot of people, sorry, to make few people like you a lot than lots of people like you a little, because you can always expand from there. That is the key to buzz. So one thing that really strikes me though is like the challenge. I'm sorry, we are off schedule, but I'm too interested. You, like, email is is used by you know, every segment of society. How do you think about and advise founders when it comes to horizontal product marketing? To when your product is used by so many, to making it resonate across so many different verticals. How do you think about that when you think about that messaging? Well, like I said, our messaging is. Our positioning is, ex is extremely precise. When it comes to the messaging, this is what I always advise to early stage startups. You don't yet know who your hero user is. So like Harry, I also invest. If, if I go to a website 
And at the very early stage, the startup is extremely precise about who it's for. That's actually probably a mistake because you don't know yet. Have it at the back of your mind. We had the positioning I just gave you at the back of my mind. But if you went to our website, and indeed if you were to go there today, you wouldn't see any of that. So what do you do? Instead, you simply extol the benefits of your product. Explain what it does for people. In our case, Superhuman helps you get through your inbox twice as fast. You reply to people faster. You'll save three hours or more every single week. But nowhere on the website will you see it's for founders or leaders or managers or executives or business development or sales or all of the people that we now support. So long story short, don't explicitly say who it's for. Just say what the benefit is. How is building for obsessed customers different? What makes that truly different to versus just building for broader customer segments? And how do you think about that in the product build out process? One of the best things about building for obsessed customers is, and people ask me this all the time, how do you get so much feedback? Well, I tell you, if your customers are obsessed, if they live or die by your service, and for all of our customers, email is mission critical, you will be swimming in feedback. At this point at Superhuman, we've now tagged and triaged over 100,000 individual different pieces of feedback. These are recorded verbatim, voices of the customer, actual sentences in a custom CRM, essentially, that we've built explicitly for the purpose of product feedback. And you just don't get this with many companies. So charge early, get obsessed customers. That's one of the benefits. So, so charge early, what, like, when should they charge? How should they think about pricing lessons there? Because also for you, like, to be, and I mean this politely, like 30, like, was it 30 bucks, 30 yes. quid? Yeah, like, that's quite a lot for email. Like, how did you come to that price? And how do you advise founders on pricing their very early iterations? So we actually charged from day one. We even charge all of our investors to use Superhuman. And, and that was- I know. <laughs> early, as, as well you know. Uh, that was in the early days. How would I advise this to founders? Well, again, I would advise surgical precision. And I want to make this super actionable. The best resource available for pricing is this book called Monetizing Innovation by Madhavan Ramanujan. Now, Madhavan describes various ways to do what he calls developing pricing. And this can get arbitrarily complicated with conjoint analyses and expensive consultants will definitely do the, the full bells and whistles approach, but you don't have to do it that way if you're an early stage startup. What we did and what everyone here can do is the Van Westendorp pricing sensitivity meter. You essentially ask your target market four questions. And I'll give you the example of Superhuman. Number one, at what price would this product, Superhuman, be so expensive that you would not buy it. Number two, at what price would this product, Superhuman, be so cheap that you'd be worried about its quality and you also would not buy it? Those prices exist. Number three, at what point would you consider this product to start getting expensive? You'd stop and think about it, but you would still actually buy it. And number four, at what point would you consider it a bargain for the money? Now, most founders, most companies intuitively orient around uh, question number four, and that's usually the right thing to do. But as we just discussed, the positioning for superhuman is premium. Our position is that we are faster and more powerful than Gmail or now Office 365. And it turns out that the question that most directly supports that position is question number three. Uh, it's starting to get expensive, but gosh darn it, email is so important to me and I want to save those three hours a week. I'm still going to buy it anyway. So that's typically what I would advise, but there is one more step, which is once you have this price figured out, and Harry does this math, I'm sure, in his sleep at this point, let's do a quick gut check on market size. <laughs> so you say you want to be a billion dollar company. Well, as we just heard, valuations are regressing to the mean. Let's assume at a billion dollars, that means that you are 10x your run rate. You need to be a hundred million dollar plus revenue business. Well, at $30, $30 a month, you do the math, it's not hard. You need 300,000 subscribers. So we asked ourselves in the early days of Superhuman, do we think we can get to 300,000 subscribers 
we answered, yeah, absolutely. We can get to 300,000 subscribers. And so we went ahead with the press. I think, so I, I totally agree with you there. And I love the kind of bottoms up TAM analysis. Uh, the one thing that I also remember very vividly was how struck people were by the onboarding process in terms of building hype. And I'm sorry, because we did have this schedule, but it wasn't my schedule, so I, I just prefer mine. Um, so like, in terms of building hype, you did the onboarding process personally with, with yourself, with other reps, with amazing team members. And everyone said it didn't scale and it wouldn't scale. Like, one, how do you reflect on that? And two, how do you advise founders on doing things that don't scale to build hype in the early days? So for those that don't know, some, a little bit of context. Superhuman is famous, infamous, if you will, for, and in a sense, we pioneered this in technology, insisting on 30-minute one-to-one -one concierge onboardings for every new person that was using the product. And in the early days, I did this myself. I actually turned up in person, and back then it was an hour, and I would bring a gift, a bottle of wine, or if you didn't drink, <laughs> what, you know, something to make you feel really special. There's all kinds of obvious reasons to do this. However, I'm not going to claim to be a genius. I didn't sit down in our office and think, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we pioneered this new go-to-market that would completely change the way that people retain and become viral and so on. We actually found it by accident. And here is how. I had this observation that most companies, especially B2C-ish companies, and I would count ourselves as B2C to B, make the terrible mistake of just launching their product. Perhaps you go on product hunts. And if you're in a market like ours, general productivity and collaboration, guess what? You'll get tens of thousands of people to sign up in the first few days. That used to be impressive. These days, that's no longer hard. But here's what happens, is those people will come in, they'll use your app, they'll kick the tires, they'll break stuff because it's early stage software, let's be real, things are broken. They'll report those bugs, and if you don't fix them in time, they'll then get disappointed and churn out. That is the very definition of a net detractor. And I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen countless times. So how do we fix this? Well, we only let on board the precise number of people that we think we can actually handle in terms of fixing bugs for. This isn't technical scaling. This is technical debt scaling. It's the debt that we all have but that we don't see. And so in the early days, this was really small. I onboarded maybe four or five people a week. And that saturated my small engineering team of 10 people. But eventually, we got the number of bugs down, and the products became higher and higher quality. We could do 10 people a week, 20 people a week, uh, until we were doing hundreds of people, thousands of people per week, and still maintaining a high quality product. What we found, and here's the reason why we continue to scale it, is that we had category-leading benchmarks across basically everything you would care about. Uh, retention, churn, net promoter score, products market fit, which is the 40% metric that you may have heard of we came up with previously. Retention, virality, really every which way you could slice it, these users were incredible. Now, as for the folks who said this wouldn't scale, here's the common misconception. If you just grow a large team of people to do onboarding for folks who are not yet sold, then yes, this won't scale. But remember, everyone who met or meets an onboarding specialist back then or today is already a customer. They've already authorized their credit card. They've already signed up. They've probably seen the sent via superhuman signature multiple times, and internally, they're mostly sold. Not 100%, but mostly. And that's what you need in order to make an approach like this work. I have to ask as well, you know, I had Brian Armstrong on the show from Coinbase the other day, and he said, you know, the NFT launch, the mistake we made was we built Buzz too early before the V1, and then never ever has a V1 ever lived up to expectations. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Like, actually, the dangers of building Buzz, kind of what if V1 doesn't live up to expectations, and, and how do you think about that? Because I've been thinking back and forth about that danger of building buzz and whether it's good to set expectations high and create it, or actually whether it can create more challenges as well? I think we need a healthy balance. Sure. I've definitely seen founders go the other way. Yeah. They don't build any buzz at all. And then by the time they're ready to launch, 
Yeah. They're starting from scratch. Totally. That's not a good idea. Do not do that. I see also, and I'm not going to name names, that would be uh, terribly unfair, of founders who build way too much buzz. Yeah. And then V1 doesn't meet expectations, which, by the way, is normal. That's to be expected. But the delta is so large, and the amount of catch up that that founder now has to do is so great that they never do actually catch up. So this is an awfully delicate balance that we need to somehow thread. I think in our case, we definitely leaned towards creating buzz in years two and three, by which point I would say we still really hadn't launched, not by any reasonable definition. But years one through two, we were hella quiet. There was barely anything we did. I was establishing thought leadership, though. For example, when Mailbox got yeah. shuttered by Dropbox, I thought, aha, here is a good way to inject myself into the news cycle. And I was able to drive north of 10,000 signups just off that little piece of news. And we did a few things like that to build our email list up. Email is still the best marketing channel of all time. So we, by the time that we launched, we had perhaps 50,000 people on the email list and another 50,000 people on Product Hunt upcoming. Can I ask, did being very public and speaking and writing, was that always very natural to you? Because the most uh, kind of common thing that I hear from founders is, I know I need to build a brand, but it's just not me. It's just not me. And I say, well, you know, no one loves going to the gym when they first go to the gym, but you know, you keep going and you get better and better. And then a year later, it's much more natural. Like, did you feel very natural and at home being that public facing figure? And how's your relationship to kind of your own personal brand building, I guess, changed over time in relation to creating buzz? It does feel really natural. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where we all need to play into our strengths. Huh. I mean, you are naturally an incredible interviewer, and it's been no, a but blessing. I'm not. I'm not. I've just done it for eight well, years. I've done so 3,000. I was terrible. So here's the thing. I think I was one of your early interviews. You were one of my very early interviews. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the first hundred. Yeah. And, I've, and I've seen Harry become, come from that humble beginning, if you don't mind my saying so, yeah. to, at this point, one of the most, if not the preeminent tech interviewer, tech personality in this industry, to the point where I'm like, you're Harry, come back on stage. And he's like, sure, <laughs> I'll just do this off the top of my head. This is fine. <laughs> but to answer your question, I find it very natural. Probably the reason is I grew up doing it competitively. Uh, I, I was in the debate team, but I'm actually a terrible debater. So in the, the way that this works in England, I don't know if this work uh, is similar in other countries, you'd have an opener, then someone would rebut, then you'd have someone rebutting that, then you'd have a closer. The thing is about being the opener, you don't have to really argue with anyone else. You don't have to rebut anything. You just get to go out there and be theatrical and really enthuse and entertain an audience. And that was my position, because I was terrible at doing the actual arguments but I was really good at riling an audience. And so I did this from a very early age, and I loved it. I, yeah, this is, this is what I do. Now, if that doesn't mean that's what every founder should do. If, this, if the idea of doing that makes you terrified or it makes you nervous, please don't do it. There are things that I absolutely suck at, and I don't, I don't even try to do them. I try and build a world-class team of other people who can do those things. So should they then pass off, not pass off, but delegate brand to their COO, CMO, to kind of build that kind of cult of personality in their brand? Should they just promote the superhuman brand? Like, do you need a personality brand within a company, given the cult of personality being so prominent in many of the big companies today? Do you see what I mean? I do, and I think the short answer is no, you do not need your company to have a cult of personality. But if you can create one, it's an amazing edge. And it we, is easier. We, we see Elon Musk doing this. Right? Whether you hate him or like him, it, kind of, it doesn't matter. He is a cult of personality, and that is probably one of his strongest assets. I totally agree. When you, when you think back kind of over the superhuman journey, I think lessons are often learned through the hardest times. So very unfairly, you, you kind of said I you know, was on the fly. So are you. Um, what was the hardest element of the journey with superhuman? And what did you learn? Gosh, the hardest element. I'm going to give you the cliched answer, which is each day feels harder than the last. Does it? So it doesn't get easier. Because I always think, 
I don't know. I think it does get easier. You have more resources. You have better teams. It's yeah. different problems. But you're not, you know, sleeping in the office or, you know. No, I mean, I never did sleep in the office. <laughs> every, every company has a different culture. We, we never had that culture. Uh, we're very much believers in this is a marathon, not a sprint. And I, I want people to be in it for the, for the very long term. And, and it shows, by the way, in our employee retention metrics and our attrition metrics, we have very, very long-lasting employees. We don't burn people out. So, gosh, there are so many hardest things I could possibly choose. Well, okay, let me be specific. You're now also selling to companies. What's hard about going from B to C, well, like direct to consumer, sorry, to like selling to companies as well? What's difficult about that transition? Yeah. So there is this thing, um, and, and I'll, I'll come to that very shortly. Jason Lemkin, uh, who, who writes the blog Sasta, amazing, and probably my favorite blog, has in many articles said that once you reach $10 million of ARR, yeah. I think his phrase is, then the cavalry is coming. Yeah. You can breathe just a little bit more easy. You know, you can maybe take a weekend every now and then, that, that kind of stuff. I'm like, I'm not sure if that's true. It's just as hard <laughs> well past that than to before that. So I don't know. But selling to companies. This is something that if I had 100% retrovision, I wish we had done earlier. So just one and a half years ago, and actually three years ago when Harry and I were last on this stage, we were 100% selling to individuals. Yep. You couldn't buy Superhuman as a company, as crazy as that sounded. Fast forward to today, and we're now selling Superhuman also to teams and to companies, and this by far is the fastest growing part of our business. Now you might think, oh, this must require some kind of fancy team features in order to do that. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true, and we drove this change without any team collaboration features whatsoever. And furthermore, I'm going to say that almost any startup here can drive this change if you're selling to an individual in the workplace. So I'll run through how this loop works, because I think it will be useful and actionable. It still starts with an individual buying superhuman. They then become brilliant at what they do. They start getting through their email twice as fast, responding faster to messages, unblocking their team, taking on more projects, and this gets noticed internally by their team, by their peers, by their managers. Superhuman then spreads virally inside companies, and there are three, because I know you're wondering, three viral mechanics that make this work. Number one is the sent via superhuman email signature, and it's Shocking that this ancient, probably the oldest viral mechanic, still works today and drives north of 20% of our site traffic. Wow. Number two, the word of mouth. People naturally want to help each other, especially inside companies. And number three, the referral and the invite mechanics. So we then grow to like a handful of seats inside a company. We then reach out to the company and say, hey, do you all want to consolidate these seats onto one team? And sometimes the company is like, why would we do that? And we say, well, you get to pay upfront and annually once, as opposed to individually, perhaps you know, nine different times, depending on how many seats you have. Number two, you hit amazing discounts when you get to 10 people. And number three, every single user is going to save three hours or more per week. So the consolidation is generally a no-brainer. And then when it hits 10 seats, we staff it with a customer success manager and an account manager. And the CSM is responsible for driving usage, adoption, and engagement. And the account manager is responsible for demonstrating the return on investment of buying Superhuman to the customer. So the accounts now grow really rapidly, and the customer derives a ton of value from Superhuman. And this loop is shockingly effective. We're now on target to quadruple team's revenue just this year alone. And further, I think basically any startup here that's selling to individuals can replicate the same loop. So we're going to do a quick fire. I'm going to hit you with a series of questions, super quick. So let's go with, what would you most like to change about the world of venture? Oh, what a <laughs> Harry always asks me these quick fire questions. And I'm like, hmm, really good question, Harry. Let me, let me ponder on that one. Yeah. Um, I would like I would like to get some we have a lot of oscillation going on right now 
between valuations being super sky high, valuations being sort of middle of the ground. If you're a founder who's coming into this new, I'd just like more clarity for the founders in terms of, and it was asked in your session, like what, for example, do you need to do to raise a Series A? Yeah. What do you know now that you wish you'd known in getting to your first 1,000 users? Thinking of the seed founders in the audience, getting from zero to 1,000 users, what do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Well, this one's easy. If I could change one thing going backwards, we would have built for teams from the get-go. Now seeing the growth that we're able to achieve, I wish that we'd done that from day one. Okay, 10 years, we did it three years ago we were here, 10 years, uh, where is Superhuman and what does that look like? Gosh, I remember this question from before you asked me, many years ago. We're, we're gonna go back on past tapes each okay. time. Uh, let's see, oh, mm -hmm. now, you, now you can track it over time, this is awful. <laughs> um, okay, so 10 years from now, we are a multi-product company. And I mean that both for Superhuman, the email client, keep your eyes peeled and stay tuned. You'll start to see editions of Superhuman tuned not just for the horizontal email professional, but specific vertical, specific job functions and specific industries, as well as brand new products that aren't even email. Now, can I say everyone, um, Rahul has done the most stellar job here. We had a schedule that someone else wrote for some, a different moderator. He had no idea of the questions that would come. I think he was exceptional. So can we give a massive hand to Rahul? That was fantastic. Thank Harry for stepping in at the last minute. Thank you.